Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's lunch hour lecture. I'm Jack Ashby from UCL Museums, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all today, and also to welcome our speaker, Dr. Barbara Penner, who is a senior lecturer in architectural history at the Bartlett School of Architecture here at UCL. Barbara's um, research includes 19th century commercial architecture, like hotels and department stores, um, honeymoon resorts, domestic interiors, and um, public conveniences, and she explores those um, structures and asking how do everyday spaces like that um, enable the formation of, of different, of particular social and cultural identities and asks whether um, they can promote social inclusion or social exclusion. She's published many books, um, including Bathroom, a later book which has just uh, recently won the Royal Institute of British Architecture as prize for outstanding university located research, um, which places her perfectly uh, particularly as tomorrow is World Toilet Day, to uh, give today's talk, Toilets and Taboos. If you join me in welcoming Dr. Barbara Penner. As Jack mentioned, I've been invited to give today's talk in honor of World Toilet Day 2014, which is tomorrow, in case it wasn't in your calendars. World Toilet Day has been running since 2004, uh, 2001, and last year it was officially recognized by the United Nations. World Toilet Day might best be described as a celebration of all things toilet, a day when campaigners around the world seek to raise awareness of the 2.5 billion people globally who have no access to basic sanitation. And the efforts of campaigners are usually humorous, playful, sometimes provocative, but the underlying message is really a deadly serious one. Toilets are essential for human health and human dignity. Yet governments and NGOs continue to find it difficult to effectively deliver sanitation projects. Um, of all of the UN's Millennium Development Goals, the MDGs, the target of reducing by half the number of people globally without access to basic sanitation is the most off track. And improving sanitation still only accounts for 5% of all NGO spending. So in today's talk, uh, what I'd like to do is lay out what I feel is at stake uh, with toilets and sanitation, why they're important. But I'd also like to talk about um, the reasons why sanitation projects seem so difficult to deliver well, and also the reasons why so many of them fail. I'd like to do this by sharing with you several case studies from my own research, um, beginning here in Victorian London, then moving to the peri-urban areas surrounding Durban, South Africa, and then returning back to London at the end. While it may feel radical uh, to talk toilets in the August setting of UCL, I would suggest that this is actually a particularly appropriate topic to discuss here. In the 19th century, UCL was actually a leader in the teaching of public health, hygiene, and sanitation, thanks to such eminent professors as Edmund A. Parks, who in 1864 wrote the best-selling um, Manual of Practical Hygiene. Um, and this book was often reprinted 
throughout the 19th century. It is also a little known fact that between 1879 and 1883, UCL actually hosted a museum of practical hygiene, the Parks Museum, which it was located somewhere in the Cruciform Building. We actually aren't entirely sure where it was. The Parks Museum aimed to improve public knowledge of sanitary science through the exhibition of good and bad examples of um, drains, sinks, pipes, traps, and also toilets. Um, and I apologize, this is a, a very poor um, image, but it was one of the few I could find uh, showing the display of defective traps. So, in fact, the pride and joy of the Parks Museum was its collection of 30 toilets, from earth closets to water closets, and the Lancet Journal declared the exhibition of toilets to be the most important exhibit of the entire museum. At the museum's glittering opening ceremony in 1879, UCL's first professor of hygiene, William Corfield, treated illustrious visitors, including the Duke of Northumberland and the Home Secretary, Richard Cross, to a personal tour of the display. So UCL has what I would call a long and noble tradition of promoting sanitation. And it's really this spirit uh, that I hope that we can revive today. So to begin with, I thought I might say something about what has led me to devote a significant part of my academic career to studying toilets, bathrooms, and sewers. I do hasten to add that I study other subjects as well, but uh, bathrooms are the subject to which I find myself returning time and time again. So how did this happen? I first stumbled across the subject of toilets in 1995 when I began my master's in architectural history here at UCL at the Bartlett School of Architecture where I teach now. And in the mid-1980s, uh, sorry, mid-1990s, Feminism was just beginning to make an impact on architectural history. And so for my dissertation, I really wanted to try to find a space that would allow me to analyze the ways in which the built environment shapes female experience. Then I happened to go on a walking tour of Camden Town our guide stopped in front of this lady's toilet, uh, which is still open today. It's at the intersection of Camden High Street and Parkway, and said, this ought to be a monument to George Bernard Shaw. And she went on to explain that between 1900 and 1905, Shaw had campaigned for this public convenience for women to be opened in the face of often furious local opposition. And so I was hooked. I was so intrigued by the fact that such a banal, seemingly ordinary space could cause this kind of controversy, but also that someone of Shaw's stature really believed that female public conveniences were something worth fighting for. And so I dug deeper, and the, dig, the deeper I dug, the more complex the story became. But the thing that continually surprised me as I read about the controversy was the level of anger and disgust 
that surrounded the debate to the extent that one counselor suggested that any woman who wanted a convenience was herself a public woman, that is to say, a prostitute, and then went on to call this public convenience an abomination. And the only way to make sense of this excessive anger is to recognize that the male counselors felt that in providing women with a convenience, they were acknowledging their right to move easily through the city streets. And this was controversial in an age where it was still believed that decent women should stay at home. So this lesson is really what I took away from Camden Town, that when people argue over toilets and over whether or not to provide them, what is generally at stake is the right of certain user groups to move through and to occupy public space. Granting or denying a group access to something as basic as a, a toilet not only affects the group's mobility, but it also tells them something about their status, their proper place in society. But I'll argue um, later on in this talk that many sanitation projects are still not uh, sensitive to the social dimension of toilets. Um, but most projects are still dominated by what I would call a technocratic view. That is, most of the time, governments and NGOs insist on talking about toilets and sewers as if they're purely rational or purely technological. Yet the moment you begin to scratch the surface, you start to realize that there's nothing natural or rational about them at all. It's impossible to talk about bathrooms without immediately finding yourself talking about so many other things as well, as social beliefs, religious practices, the body, sexuality. And through their design, location, and signage, toilets are an incredibly powerful tool of creating and maintaining uh, differences between people, differences between men and women, Asian and Western, and also black and white. And this explains why any changes to the status quo are often so bitterly contested. Um, but it also explains why toilets are often places where disenfranchised social groups make their claims for equal rights, whether we're talking about women in the 19th century, civil rights groups in the 1960s, disability campaigners in the 1980s to the transgendered population today. And I think it's because toilets are such a revealing social index that I keep on being drawn back um, and I keep on talking about them. So, now I'd like to flash forward uh, to 2010 when I undertook a research project in Durban, South Africa, along with my colleague, Dr. Sarah Bell, uh, who's from Civil and Geomatic Engineering. Um, and this project, Essential Diversions, was supported by a UCL Grand Challenges small grant. And I was drawn back to toilets because I just had this feeling that there was a new buzz about them, a new energy about them. Whereas in 1995, people had thought I was crazy for wanting to talk about toilets. Uh, by 2010, many more people were beginning to take them seriously, especially in development circles. 
And this was very exciting for me to see um, because sanitation has for so long been an underfunded, unloved cause in comparison to its sexier, cleaner companion, water. So what had changed since the 1990s? Though they never achieved all they promised, the UN's Millennium Development Goals were still, I think, quite an important initiative in terms of raising the profile of sanitation. Um, even though the sanitation target was uh, really tucked away here under goal seven, ensure environmental sustainability. And sanitation, uh, even more importantly perhaps, had finally managed to attract some powerful and well-funded uh, new supporters, most notably the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which in 2012 set teams of university researchers the ambitious challenge of reinventing the toilet. The challenge was to create a low-cost toilet that can be used anywhere in the world and that can generate energy and reclaim uh, waste nutrients without any water supply or sewerage. So it's, uh, I think, a very tall order. The Gates Foundation entry into the field was mainly motivated by health. Every year, 700,000 children under the age of five die of fecally transmitted diseases, uh, especially diarrhea. And improved sanitation is shown to reduce child mortality by a third. Sanitation has also been shown to be much more cost effective than many other kinds of intervention, which is why toilets are often referred to by NGOs as the cheapest medicine or the cheapest vaccine. Um, for every pound invested, toilets are said to improve four pounds in terms of improved health and productivity. And finally, more and more studies were providing evidence that improved sanitation would bring um, social benefits, especially for women, as clean, safe toilets ensure female health, reduce labor for women, limit women's exposure to assault, um, and also increase school attendance for girls post-puberty. So for all of these reasons, sanitation was increasingly being spoken about as essential for human dignity. And I think that this is something that George Bernard Shaw would have recognized, even if he might not have used that term. In 2010, the UN at last declared that sanitation was a basic human right, along with water. So this seemed all very positive and very straightforward. People were starting to say all of the right things. But again, my own research had warned me that these non-functional human factors are often overlooked when it actually comes to implementing sanitation projects, and so it proved in South Africa. So we went to Durban specifically to study bees, uh, urine diverting toilets, or UDs. And UDs are especially interesting because they're dry toilets. Um, and Durban's Water and Sanitation Unit at Sequini Water has installed over 90,000 of these since 2003. Urine diverting toilets, as the name suggests, 
divert urine into a separate compartment for feces, um, which allows the feces to dry out more quickly and then allows it to be disposed of more easily on site. Um, and so you'll see, looking at the UD units, they have a wall-mounted urinal for men. Um, and then, sorry, looking into the toilet bowl, you see that there's a hole here where um, women and children are meant to urinate. Because of the large scale of Durban's UD program, it is really regarded as a very important test of the viability of this technology. And on paper, at least, Durban's UD program seems to be a very sensible solution to a very real problem. That is, how do you provide sanitation to rural or peri-urban areas which are out of the reach of conventional sewerage um, due to water scarcity or to cost? Prior to the installation of UDs, most households would have made do with latrines, buckets, um, and small children would have likely been open defecators. And this is obviously a serious health risk. And indeed, the immediate spur for the rollout of these UD toilets was a cholera outbreak in Etiquini between 2000 and 2001. But more generally, by 2000, the lack of toilets had come to be seen as a real embarrassment in South Africa. Unlike many governments, the African National Congress has been alert to sanitation issues since it came into power in 1994, mainly because it sees uh, providing basic services as key to reversing the inequities of apartheid. When it emerged in 2000 that 42% of South Africa's population still had no access to any form of sanitation, the government declared that it would provide free basic water and sanitation to all. So the point really is that the UD program began in an atmosphere of crisis and of political expediency. And this, incidentally, is the same atmosphere um, out of which London's own sewage system had been born as well, 150 years ago. Etiquini Water had to get uh, sewerage, sanitation, to as many households as possible, and it had to do this without sewers and with very limited free water. And UDs were seen as the best possible solution. They're cost efficient, low maintenance, keep feces out of the water supply, and this is really a key result in a country where children continue to die of diarrhea. But as I was touring around, another side of the story quickly emerged um, from those people like uh, Dudu Kamalo, who took us around one morning, um, who actually have to live with the UDs. Far from being grateful for them, people didn't like them. This was a very clear message. And personally, I don't think it's hard to understand why. Even when UDs function as they should and are properly maintained, the simple fact that people are expected to dispose of their own feces once the composting chambers are full make it um, an, a culturally unacceptable option for many. Above all, Users were very aware that uh, many urban dwellers in Durban had full flush toilets. And for them, dry toilets really became a symbol of their inferior status. 
Why can't we have flushing toilets like in neighboring townships? was an oft repeated lament. In fact, anger over perceived inequities in sanitation provision has led to some spectacular violence in South Africa. For instance, um, just before my trip, um, Kailicha in Cape Town was rocked by the so-called toilet war where the provision of poorly enclosed toilets by the ruling Democratic Alliance Party um, here, sorry, here, um, led to accusations of racism and then led to these uh, very violent street clashes. Um, and friends in Cape Town tell me that this war is in fact ongoing. It never came to this kind of situation in Durban. Mostly, it seemed, people just didn't use their facilities. And um, if they had them, they reverted to their traditional long drop latrines. But this failure highlights one of the greatest problems facing governments and NGOs today. How can users be encouraged to develop a sense of ownership, even of pride in their facilities, and be encouraged to use and to maintain them. Since the 1980s, experts have frequently posed this question, as project after project has shown that people often don't adopt the free toilets that are provided for them. The consensus now is that it's not enough to supply toilets. Uh, people have to want them, and if they don't want them, they have to be persuaded to want them using a mixture of hygiene education and marketing techniques to stimulate demand. Melinda Gates, for instance, argues that the toilet needs to be repositioned as a modern, trendy device and suggests that Coca-Cola might be a good model for how this could be done. Um, other people speak, too, of treating toilets more like mobile phones, which have very successfully penetrated even quite remote areas due to aspirational marketing. As a result, six billion people globally have access to mobile phones versus the 4.5 billion who have access to improved sanitation. Yet, if I just go back to Durban for a moment, what I encountered there wasn't really a marketing problem. It was what I would describe as a design problem. There had been no attempt to humanize these UD units, which had been created through a pure engineering process with little thought as to how to accommodate, let alone appeal to the user. The resulting units they don't look too bad here, but um, please do take my word for it. The resulting units were, were quite grim. Um, they were these concrete monoliths, um, often located on windswept sites quite far away from the homes that they were meant to serve. And because they were built on top of these composting units, they could only be reached by quite steep stairs which made them difficult for the elderly or the disabled to access. And also, small children were frightened of them or didn't know how to use them. So for the most part, children under five um, simply carried on with open defecation as before. So rather than turning to marketing techniques, to convince people to like their toilets, it seemed to me that it would be better to first ensure that people were actually being given 
user-friendly, culturally appropriate, and dignified designs. And designers should be playing some part in making this happen. Despite these problems, uh, Durbin, though, was very inspirational in other ways. And our visit fundamentally shifted, in many ways, our thinking about sanitation. And I would say it shifted it very positively. In particular, we were really struck by how committed Etiquini Water is to exploring radical sanitation solutions that don't depend on water and allow for resource recovery. Um, so, for instance, right now they have a urine harvesting project underway, um, which allows them to produce a phosphorus-based fertilizer uh, called struvite. As proof of its commitment to a dry future, um, Etiquini has said that has created this waterborne edge, which you see here delineated in black, beyond which it says waterborne sanitation will never go. And this has been very controversial, but Neil McLeod, who's the very dynamic head of Etiquini Water, really absolutely believes that the pressure on the world's water supplies will make dry sanitation a must in future. McLeod also believes that the so-called developed world's reliance on these uh, big centralized water systems makes it a dinosaur. This is, this is what he likes to, uh, a phrase he likes to use. Totally unprepared for coming environmental challenges. And seeing our own sewerage system through this very radical South African environmental perspective made a profound impression. When we returned to London, we were suddenly keenly aware that when a sanitation problem is talked about, it's always talked about implicitly as if it's a developing world problem, never a developed world problem. It's a problem for people out there in Southeast Asia, India, Sub-Sahara Africa, never for us with our big system approaches that work largely invisibly to sweep our waste away. Out of sight, out of mind, flush and forget. But can we be so complacent? In the developed world, we're facing problems that put our inherited sanitation model under far greater pressure as well. The stress on the world's water supplies, the high cost of energy required to move waste long distances for treatment, um, the expense, of maintaining and improving aging infrastructure, and also, of course, the increase of natural disasters, to which, as the Christchurch earthquake so tragically showed in 2011, infrastructure is particularly vulnerable. Um, and uh, after the Christchurch earthquake, many people were left without um, access to waterborne sewerage for over a year. Quite simply, is it still viable that each person in the UK flushes, on average, 50 liters of drinkable water down the toilet every day? So we returned to London inspired uh, to try to open up some more radical conversations about sanitation here too, and to really attempt to foster an approach that was more global in its outlook, more cross-cultural, um, and also that would be in some ways more open to alternatives. 
And I would suggest, um, this is my particular bias, but I would suggest that history has a very important role to play in setting up these kinds of conversations. If we hope to challenge present systems, spaces, and behaviors, then it's crucial that we understand how and why our present system has come into being and how it's become deeply embedded in our culture through a variety of means, through infrastructure, through sanitary laws, um, and through our own habits, expectations, and training. And I use the word training here quite deliberately because we all are literally trained to use our bathroom equipment in a particular way from a very early age. And this was the main reason why I wrote my recent book, Bathroom. I wanted to give a historical account of how the developed world has ended up with the particular sanitation model it has and how this model has been established as the global gold, global gold standard for sanitation through trade, war, and colonialism. But my ultimate hope really was just to try to make the familiar seem strange again, to show how our own modern system for dealing with water and waste emerged at a very specific moment in time, how it reflects and supports certain cultural values like bodily privacy, and how it's far less neutral and more contingent than we've been taught to believe. The cultural specificity of our system is, of course, immediately apparent um, the moment one travels outside of Europe or North America. In other parts of the world, such as Southeast Asia, India, China, communal bathing and toileting arrangements remain the norm. And the moment that I tell people that I study uh, toilets, they immediately tend to offer up some vivid anecdote of some embarrassing or shocking foreign toilet uh, encounter. For better or for worse, the bathroom is still the place where we feel our cultural otherness most strongly. But the particularity of our own system is equally apparent when we revisit our own history as well. In Britain, we have quite a triumphalist narrative of waterborne sanitation, starring, of course, the engineer Joseph Bazalgette, the designer of London's sewage system, commonly described as one of the greatest achievements of the Victorian era and still in use today. What often isn't emphasized in historical accounts, however, is the fact that in Basil Jett's own time, and for many decades after, prominent sanitary reform reformers fiercely criticized him for designing a system that used the same water sources for drinking and for waste disposal. And these reformers um, championed alternatives. Uh, for instance, sewage farms. There was over 100 sewage farms in Britain in the 1880s, and also um, earth closets. And this is why, for instance, at the Parks Museum, water closets and earth closets were displayed side by side. To these critics, there was nothing preordained or natural or even particularly sensible about the idea of waterborne sewerage. They certainly never imagined that it would become a universal solution to waste disposal. Throughout the 20th century, figures such as the visionary engineer Buckminster Fuller continued to reject waterborne sewerage and flush toilets and sought out less centralized and less energy intensive alternatives from composting toilets to natural waste treatment, so things like natural wetlands. Um, 
And the big attraction of these was that um, they all promised to close the ecological loop, that is to return nutrients to the soil. Fuller also explored more um, water-efficient ways of showering, such as his fog gun, which used only a liter of water per cleanse. And this experimentation does continue on a small scale today, for instance, by UK-based companies like Luwad, uh, which proposes the use of anaerobic digesters to produce biogas for household use, um, for cooking, for instance. Um, and I think methane digesters are really interesting because they're in common use in China and in India. And it's an example of um, reverse technology transfer where the developed world can learn from the developing. And it was not only environmentalists who have questioned our bathroom inheritance. As we've seen also, there's been a very long tradition of um, rights activists, from feminists to disability activists, um, who argue that current designs for bathrooms could very easily be made more um, inclusive and healthier for bodies. So the point of delving into the history of alternative sanitation and rights campaigns in the book was to really try to get beyond some of the taboos and our embedded assumptions about toilets and open up a space for more critical reflections on the future bathroom to get people to ask, hmm, why do our bathrooms look the way they look? And what would it mean to design them another way? And as important as it was, I think, to lay out these challenges in a book, um, it was also very important to me um, to get the message out through other channels as well and to reach broader audiences. And this led to last year's UC Lu Festival, uh, which opened uh, on World Toilet Day uh, last year with this uh, rather wonderful uh, toilet ribbon cutting ceremony, uh, which is actually, I, I have to confess, one of the high points of my career. Um, <laughs> it really filled me with joy to see Michael Arthur cutting uh, the toilet ribbon. Um, and I'd really just like to end this talk uh, with a few slides of the UC Lu Festival because it was a culmination of efforts by myself and colleagues at the Bartlett and in engineering to raise awareness of sanita sanitation issues abroad and here. Um, but it was also this very conscious attempt to bring UCL's tradition of practical, hands-on sanitation research into the 21st century. We wanted to bring together lots of different people, toilet entrepreneurs, water experts, everyday members of the public, and we wanted to get them to learn things, test things, do things. We had lots of um, different activities. We had a film festival, comedy night, lectures, and also loo tours, which were given by lovely Rachel Erickson, who's sitting here today. Um, we also had a makeathon hosted in conjunction with UCL's Institute of Making, uh, where students were challenged to design a new toilet system for UCL. And in the spirit of the Parks Museum, we had our own 21st century toilet exhibition which featured several prototype toilets, um, including this ergonomic semi-squat one by Peter Codling, um, a Luwatt unit which had biodegradable bags for sealing waste for collection, 
Um, and there we had the tiger worm toilet, which uses tiger worms uh, for composting. But I think uh, we went one better than the Parks Museum in one respect, which was that we actually had a working public ecological toilet. Um, our model, an EnviroLet model, uh, had a 0.2 liter flush that's in comparison to the six liters that a full flush toilet will use. Um, and our idea here was we wanted to show solidarity um, with the 2.6 billion people globally who don't have access to a toilet. Um, but we also really just wanted to bring these discussions back to London, back to Bloomsbury, back to UCL, um, and to get people to ask, if London was the heart of the 19th century global sanitation revolution, then what will its role be in the 21st? And so I wish you happy World Toilet Day uh, in advance. And I'm not sure if there's time for any questions, but no, <laughs> sorry. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Barbara Penner. Um, I'm afraid we do not have any time for questions, so that's very disappointing. But um, hope to see you again next lunch hour lecture. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you mostly to Dr. Barbara Penner.